culture, bloating, parody, racism, allyship, human rights, mental health, trauma, guilt, stigma, bias. Load completed. It is what it is. That's crazy. This is Counterculture with Crystal Berger. Let's get into it. Today on Counterculture. So I attended Black Women Talk Tech back in 2018 with an idea in my mind, and I came to cover your event, and I wrote a piece for Bold TV, one of your partners at the time, and Bold TV um, had me there covering a story, and I said, wait a minute, this could be a thing, and literally Black Women Talk Tech inspired me to go on the journey from transitioning from a journalist to a founder. So Regina, I just want to say I am honored to be here with you today and we are going to get into it about how we can use technology as a pathway to equity. So how are you today, Regina? I I am better now. I <laughs> I am just so um so excited and and humbled by, you know, your your story and being able to to connect, right? You know, black women it's not a matter of of being unprepared. Um, success is when preparation meets opportunity. And so it's not a matter of the preparation. It is, in fact, getting access to the opportunities and, and, and knowing that it's possible and knowing that um, we have very viable business uh, options that, that need to be explored and ultimately monetized. So how do we get those resources together? I love it. I, I'm so excited that, to, to have this conversation. You know, I, I would love for you know everyone to to come to our conferences and be able to to get some sort of inspiration to do something. Uh, entrepreneurship is not for everyone, uh, to be sure, um, but there are other ways to support the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, and there's there's lots of ways for us to build wealth in Black and Brown communities. You said something powerful just now. You said actually how preparation meets the actual opportunity. And you know, as a Black woman, a woman of color, and even just as a woman. More often times than not, we're overprepared. Like my aunties used to say, your ice better be colder, you know, when you go into these environments, yes, right? Yes, yes. And I really want to just kind of dig into that because the work that you're doing at the core is really providing the opportunity for those who are already prepared. So share with me that moment when you decided that this is the journey that I want to take. Ooh. Um, so I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, my dad was an entrepreneur. His dad was an entrepreneur. I went to business school with an entrepreneur, um, you know, major and always knew I wanted to run a business and didn't know, you know, what business it would be. Um, you know, decided to, to launch a tech startup in 2014, uh, focused on beauty. Um, so it was actually the first on-demand, on-location beauty booking app for women of color. So think Uber. Um, using, you know, GPS and on-demand technologies to send a stylist to your house, hotel, or office. Um, and so I considered myself like, you know, pretty smart. I, like I said, gone to business school and done all the things and, and had the degrees and this, that, and the third and got into the tech industry and said, oh, oh, oh what is this? I have no idea what tech languages and coding languages, what's a tech stack, what is a cap table, you know, what is an MVP, the TAM and the SAM. And the, like, I was like, oh, what is this? Um, and that was really the impetus behind saying, hey, wow, you know, there, there is so much more learning. Um, when you specifically focus on the tech industry, um, there is a, like a whole new language. And, and, you know, a lot of people aren't willing and open to sharing that language with you, um, especially, you know, opening up doors um, where people don't look like you. So, you know, we wanted to make sure that that was really the impetus behind Black Women Talk Tech. We didn't have a seat at the table, so it was time to build our own. Um, and we said, you know, let us create conferences and the convenings and opportunities for us to resource. Um, how do we get the right people in the room? How do we get the right investors in the room? How do we get the right support system in order for us to build billion dollar businesses? Because the ideas were there. You know, that, that was never the issue. Um, the, you know, the, the challenge that we had was saying, okay, you know, if we're having these problems, there has to be other women having these problems. And boy, you know, have these women, you know, come out in droves over the past several years. And um, I love being able to, to share more success stories and, and hearing your story, Crystal, we add to that. Um, and we add to that power. 
For sure. Now, Regina, I do want to kind of give a, a visual for those who may be detached from this story, right? They may say, oh, well, you're smart. You, you went to business school. You have an MBA. It's going to be okay. You can raise money, right? And so I think for those who will view this that aren't Black, aren't of color, or aren't even women, right? They are removed from that conversation. So could you share like an intimate detail of an experience that you had as a founder to really paint that picture? Oh, hmm, hmm. <laughs> I will share, I will share uh, a story that, you know, I actually don't love sharing, but it actually hits home very, you know, it, it can illustrate the, the, the challenges very well. So, um, you know, starting Trust Noir, we were hosting a MTV movie awards, um, I'm sorry, MTV video awards beauty salon. Um, close to Penn Station in New York City um, because the event was being was at Madison Square Garden. So we were styling and providing beauty services for some of the influencers and some of the folks who were on their way. And so um, we had rented a, a space um, at a co-working space and you know had hosted the event throughout the day. The next day I get an email saying that someone from my team stole uh, an iPad and a bottle of Johnny Walker alcohol. <laughs> and I just was like, I'm sorry, what? What? what why <laughs> what? we do I'm that? Sorry, what? Why? Why? Like what? And mm -hmm. and no, no question. You know, like complete accusation. Like it had to have been us. Mm -hmm. and it had to have been, you know, the 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 black folks in 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 the space, mind you. Other people were in the building throughout the entire weekend, and yet, you know, we were the ones that that were accused of of stealing. And so that that was that was tough. Uh, you know, I'm not even gonna lie. <laughs> that one was tough, and 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 um, it rem it's a reminder. You know, it's definitely a reminder of you know what uh, what what we're up against, right? You know, we live in an environment where um, it is not designed for black and brown entrepreneurs, black and brown people to succeed. Literally, you know, the systems are are set up um, to to you know to prevent us from access, right? You know, we've seen that it, with PPP loans, just a quick note, you know, PP, for, for entrepreneurs trying to get PPP loans, they had a better chance of using uh, online technology banks that used algorithms that did not take location, race, or yeah, zip codes online in order to, oh, you know, God. actually receive yeah. funding. So, you know, we have to think about why is that? Why are um, traditional banking and lending institutions, um, you know, prejudiced or, you know, have systems in place that prevent um, people of color from getting access to financing. Whereas, you know, when you're able to pursue that financing online, um, you're able to do it, you know, I think it was something like 20 to 30 percent higher uh, approval rates for, for online banks versus traditional lenders. So, and that's just one example, right? You know, there's, there's countless examples of, you um, you know these micro, you know microaggressions or macroaggressions, to be honest, um, that 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 prevent the economic access, um, and ultimately that also, you know, it, it influences our GDP. It influences the the ability to for to generate jobs, to generate you know more you know economic power in in the U.S. is it's it literally is a a barrier to 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 so much more success that we could have. And the layers that you just peeled back there for the audience, Regina, I think is so powerful. But one thing I, I want you to share with the audience, for you specifically and your business partner with Black Women Talk Tech, you have some amazing partners, you have a lot of sponsorships. And so there is a dance that you have to do prior to going into these conversations, right, to get the access to the capital, uh, to actually get the sponsors on board. So internally, since we want to kind of bridge that pathway or that, 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 that way to getting the capital. What are some of the things that you do before going into an environment where you're probably going to be asking someone who doesn't look like you for money, um, or they haven't related to someone with your demographics? So what do you do to actually get to your coins at the end of the day? Um, Crystal, you know, I, at this point, it's very easy. I, I think that, you know, maybe in the beginning, it might have been, you know, maybe a little awkward, or, you know, I might not have had all of the talking points. But, you know, the, the bottom line is that both entrepreneurs and Fortune 500 businesses want the same thing. 
Um, do they want to make money or not? I like money. Okay, let me throw my, I'll put both hands up. I, I am um, unapologetic in focusing on building wealth for black and brown communities, full stop. Um, so, you know, let us make sure that if both of us are aligned towards that goal, let's figure out the best ways to do that. Um, you know, I think that there's definitely a fine line um, between, you know, taking money just for the sake of taking money um, mm -hmm. versus actually selecting the partners that will, that will in fact add value to entrepreneurs and to our founder community. And so we are selective. Um, we do want to make sure that we're not just, you know, saying, hey, we'll take anything and everything. Um, what, what, what do you have to offer? You know, these are business owners. These are CEOs that are buying business products. They're buying financial services. They're building their product on hosting platforms like Google Cloud or Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure. So, you know, when you're built and you're when you're courting these CEOs, um, there there should be you know there there should be an economic advantage to that. Um, so, you know, going into these conversations knowing that this community is valuable. Um, both in the short term and long term, uh, per, makes the conversations easy. Now, one thing I did hear you mention in an interview, you talked about the importance of having a proof of concept when you come into the door uh, with an organization or an entity that you're pitching to. Could you share what is the baseline for founders or individuals who are kind of playing with the idea of going into technology? What should they be looking to put forward as a proof of concept in order to get people behind their, their vision? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it definitely depends on what stage, right? If you're in the idea stage, how are you thinking about validating that idea? Um, have you done some research? Have you talked to customers? Have you built any focus groups? Have you done any surveys? What actual data do you have that can validate that this idea is something that's actually solving a pain point? And that that particular product is something that someone's willing to, to buy, someone, someone's willing to pay money for it. There's a lot of problems out here that people just don't care about, and they're just willing to, to suck it up and, and move on. Is there an actual pain point that it can be monetizable? Um, I think you know, really understanding whether or not that that's something that your, your product can fulfill is definitely step one. Um, if you've done that and you've started to you know, build you know, that, that validation, I would say the next step is to create what's called product market fit. So like, do you have a large enough market for this product to fill as, you know, to address as many of the pain points within that market? So, uh, and that's kind of where we start off talking about traction, right? You know, you, how, how are you building traction? Is it with customers? Is it with potential clients that you're putting into a pipeline? Is it followers on social media? Is it your email list? Is it your, you know, IG followers? So, you know, there's lots of different ways to define traction. It's not always dollars. It's not always revenue, especially in these early stage companies. Um, but there needs to be something that also allows you to see forward movement. Um, you know, you don't want to stay in just the pipeline stage for too long, right, before you're actually able to close just one customer, just three customers, is a big deal. Um, so definitely depends on the stage, you know, but, but being able to, to get that er, those early wins and get that traction, those are the kinds of stories you're going to want to be able to tell an, an investor that's going to say, and if I had this money, I could do more, mm. right? So, so you're coming in saying, I've done all of this on my own. I've done all of this with either, you know, my own funds, I've bootstrapped, I've, I've my friends and family round, my pitch competition winnings, my crowdfunding campaign. I've done this much with this little money, right? And if I had this much more money and you'd have the numbers, I'd be able to prove, you know, this much more revenue, capture this many more, uh, clients be able to extend runway for X amount of months, so on and so forth. No, that's great feedback. And guys, I hope you guys are taking notes. You have your pen and your paper, you're dropping questions in the actual chat because you're getting it from someone who's done it and helped so many do it. So Regina, one thing that you said in that process was not staying in the pipeline too long. And if you aren't in this space and not familiar with this space, could you expound a little bit more on that pipeline stage and, and what you mean by not staying there too long? Sure. So if you are, uh, let's see, if you are a B2B company, uh, meaning that you are, you know, providing a product to, let's say, Fortune, Fortune 500 companies, 
um, you know, it can be challenging, you know, navigating through Microsoft to find the right decision maker um, in order to, you know, find the person that's actually going to purchase your product. You know, what software, what technology is this department going to use in order to, you know, help them um, better manage their data or vi data visualization tool, whatever it is. Um, and let's say you found that person at Microsoft, you found that person at Salesforce, you found that person at Intuit, you found that person at Dell. Um, so you have a pipeline of clients, potential clients, but none of them have actually signed on the dotted line and given you money. Mm. Right. So, you know, so there, it's step one is to find them and to get them interested for sure. But what you also want to do is convert two of them. Right. You, you know, you don't want to stay in just the pipeline phase for, for too long, because ultimately, if you're continuing to have conversations with investors, the next time you talk to them, something should be different. So if you talk to them and say, hey, I've got five people in my pipeline and you talk to them in June, by August, one of them should be in your pipe. One of them should be a paying customer, mm -hmm. right? So, so just kind of making sure that there's forward movement and that something is different every time you're sending out your investor updates every month or if you're doing your check-ins. Because again, investors want to know ahead of time, right? Like you want to get on their radar. You want to be able to let them know, hey, I'm coming and I'm working on this and it's really amazing and this, this market is, is hot. And you know, you're you're gonna wanna have this kind of product and I'm gonna come back to you with, with progress. When I come back, you better be ready to cut a check. So like let's get it. So, you know, that that's that's what I'm that's what I mean in terms of um, converting a pipeline. And also having the confidence to to move it forward, Regina, because one thing that we hear a lot of women speak of specifically in, in technology is imposter syndrome. And I'm not saying that that's not real, um, but it is a challenge that a lot of people feel for you, right? And, and your founder and, and even in your in your first, uh, your beauty tech company, what did that imposter syndrome look like for you? Or did you even experience it at all? Definitely experienced it. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely experienced it. I, you know, thought, you know, what am I doing? <laughs> what in the absolute hell am I doing? Number one. Um, number two, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking to these investors. Do they, are they even listening to me? Um, you know, you talk to a lot of white men with no hair about a beauty product, about <laughs> hair. So at the time, it's like, like, you know, literally and figuratively. Mm. Um, so, you know, there, you're going to have a ton of no's. There's just, there's a ton, a ton, a ton of no's. People who are questioning your ability, questioning the model, questioning how much money you have, questioning your numbers. Like there's just, there's constant questions and pushing and challenging. So Number one, you have to have a thick skin, hands down, you know, and I, and I came, my, my background is in retail and fashion. So I already had a very thick skin working with crazy designers and, and, and creative people. So the, the thick skin was definitely not the issue. It was more so, you know, just feeling, you know, especially on the technology side, um, you know, I had to, you know, I, if I had done it, if I would do it again, it's not to say I would go to a coding class, but I would at least do some sort of like coding for dummies, I would say, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, you end up, if I think about how many CTOs I went through, um, I went through a lot and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, the, and the, the tech can kill your business, you know, mm -hmm. the end. So, um, so yeah, so there was a lot of imposter syndrome around that. And then for Black Women Talk Tech, I think that um, part of, part of our, our just ongoing challenge is that, you know, when we started in 2017, you know, there were very few, you know, organizations, people, you know, just literally talking about being a, a, a woman entrepreneur in tech, period. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you were black or white or whatever, like mm -hmm. no one was talking about women in as entrepreneurs, right? Like there's when people who are working in tech and then there's people who are literally owning the tech and building the tech. So I really think that it's it's so important that um, there has been a huge growth and a huge change up until now. Mm -hmm. But in the very beginning, you know, folks were like, who are you? <laughs> what are you doing? You were the only woman, let alone woman of color mm -hmm. in these rooms. So so that that in and of itself, you know, 
engendered, you know, some some imposter syndrome because you're like, how did I how did I even get this invite? I don't even think I sh- I don't even think I should be here because <laughs> I'm literally the only woman here. So it's like, should I be here? Is this a fraternity event or something? I don't even know. Yeah, and and really moving past the emotions, right? To 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 get what it is that you want. So in your process, Regina, I know you previously mentioned that you had a marketplace. It was an on demand marketplace. Can we talk about building a one-sided platform versus a two-sided platform and even how that resonates with uh, investors and people who would possibly be interested in giving giving you capital for your business? For sure. So there are tons of investors who focus on marketplaces. And if you are building a marketplace, it's definitely more, it's beneficial to work with an investor that's built marketplaces before. Mm -hmm. Um, It's almost as if you're building two businesses, right? Because you're building the supply side and the demand side, um, determining which side to build first. How do you, you know, how do you resource both of them? Um, you know, how are you looking at the market outlook in terms of demand and in terms of supply for both sides? So I would say that uh, they're definitely different. You know, the, the models are, are very different, um, but very achievable. You know, like we've seen with social media, like there's just so much that you can do with community building at this point. Um, and if you have a really strong message and a great product, you know, you are still able to build the, build community. It's definitely harder now. Algorithms have changed, you know, Mm. Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, Now there's um, Discord, Reddit, Substack, like there's other places where you can build community other than kind of traditional social media. But um, I would say that, you know, having having someone help with the expertise is is going to be important. Um, Again, a one-sided marketplace where you're literally just selling curl cream to a store or, you know, curl cream to a Mm. consumer directly. Not to say that it's easier. It's definitely just a different model. Um, But there's, there's a lot more complexity in, in building a two-sided marketplace than, than just, you know, going, um, going in one direction. Now, in your opinion, do you, I know you mentioned specifically pitching and, and bringing your product to uh, investors who invest in marketplaces specifically. Do you believe that uh, investors kind of shun upon a two part, a two sided marketplace at all? No, absolutely not. You know, there, again, there are investors that specifically invest in in marketplaces, i.e., they're looking for startups that are working on you know on evolving the marketplace. Um, there's, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing stays the same in technology. Um, there's, there's constant uh, innovation and there's, there's constant change. And so for those that are able to, you know, kind of maximize or, you know, capitalize on what's next and what's new in, in, in marketplaces, and, um, there is, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. And then also industry-wise, you know, there, it's, it, there is still white space. Um, to be had in exploring marketplaces in, unex- in unexpected places, right? So we're very familiar with um, like consumer marketplaces where it's one side is consumer and one side is, is professional. Um, there's professional to professional, there's consumer to consumer, there's government to consumer, there's government. Like, so, so I think that there's a lot more opportunity than, than one could potentially think of now. And a, a, a smart, savvy, connected, and resourced entrepreneur can definitely, you know, discover and capitalize on that. For sure. Now, now talking about capitalizing on opportunities, one thing that Black Women Talk Tech does every single year, you have your pitch competition, yes. <laughs> and yes. and you've given away so much capital to women who deserve it, rightfully so. Um, so yes. I do want to give you kudos for that. But what are the things that um, people who win your pitch competition? What is it that they do right? Uh, so the what I would say the one thing that all of our pitch competition winners have done right is de- is demonstrate their product market fit. So you know when they by the time they've gotten to our pitch competition, they are able to very clearly describe the product and clearly describe how it's tr- how it's addressing the need in the community. And not only is it addressing it, it's addressing it in a big way. It's moving fast. It's, it's, you know, it's gaining steam um, and they've got either, you know, big clients to prove it, you know, if it's something that's a, a, a B2B platform and they have, you know, big names to prove it, or they've got big size in terms of customers. So well, uh, I'll, uh, I think about uh, in 20, 
2019, in 2019, our pitch competition winner. And I always love sharing the story because um, Simone Sanders is the founder of Don't Get Mad, Get Paid. And this is a platform that helps women uh, navigate the child support process here in America. And think about how big the market size is of unpaid child support. Massive. Massive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's, it's, it's these untapped markets, right? It's these untapped opportunities that if someone were to figure out, you know, there's a lot of money to be made. And she, with, with very little, do you know, very few dollars, you know, mm -hmm. she had not raised any money. Um, she just, she had just been working on this, you know, on her own. She was a lawyer. She was, you know, helping clients and, 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 you know, just doing a ton of market research, right. For years. Mm. Um, but then realized that she could use technology to automate and in turn scale uh, the, the access and the resources to more women. Um, and, and I'll, let me also take a step back. It's not to say that women are the only ones going after child support. So right. let me just, you know, correct that. Um, I would say that probably women are her primary customer, but not her only one. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and so it was so clear. It, it was it was very clear that this was a market that was so unique that she could own it, that she had first mover advantage, that she had a product that could work, that she already had customers that were paying customers. And, you know, by the time she had gotten to us, it was like, take the money. <laughs> so, so I would say that all of our pitch competition winners have really... Um, been, you know, can demonstrate, you know, very clearly that that they've been able to nail their product market fit and, and our dollars just help them move to the next level. Mm -hmm. You know, they help them, you know, they, they know that these dollars can can help them, um, you know, add a new person to their team or expand their marketing strategy or, you know, be able to pay for some legal patent or trademark application or something like that. So um, it's been great to see. No, and that's a great example. Uh, Simone's story is a great example. And I do want to kind of go in on a couple of the things that you mentioned about it. One, how important is the narrative uh, within your product that you're building, especially in the tech space, and actually being able to articulate that? And then the second piece of that is, is that you mentioned that someone like Simone, she had the customers, she had product market fit, she had all of these great things and no funding. And so I do want to talk a little bit about the why behind that in a second, but I would like to first uh, get to how important is that narrative in, in tech and, and actually, again, getting getting equity? So to make sure I understand the question, you're asking how important is it to articulate your product, like either, what the product does or? Either the product, really articulating the story of the product or even, even the founder story. How important is that in you actually being able to impress investors at the end of the day. Sure. Um, so definitely you have you have to be able to articulate the product. Um, you know, the product is what makes money. Um, and, and I think that, you know, the, the clearer you're able to articulate that, the better. Um, however, what we also have discovered is that, you know, it's not always the CEO that can articulate the product the best, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes the product officer, right? Like the, per the chief product officer, the person that, is the engineer, you know, sometimes they're able to articulate what that product does because they built it, right? So um, understanding the founder's role is really meant to know their strengths and weaknesses and build the team around them of, you know, filling in the holes and filling in the gaps. So again, I, I was a non-technical founder. My goal was to find, you know, technical resources and technical capabilities to be able to balance, you know, what I had in a from a marketing and you know storytelling and, and operations you know point of view, um, and so you know so and and both are important. So when we think about the founder story, uh, investors while they like the product, they invest in people, hands down, um, and that has been the challenge because mm. you know if you think about the good old bro network, they invest in people, they invest in who they know, right. and so when, so this is kind of what we're trying to kind of fight against is, you know, always kind of defaulting to an investor feeling comfortable with you. Um, because traditionally, you're not going to feel comfortable with people that you don't know, or people that don't, who also don't have the same network as you. Um, so, so that's why we're, we'd like to put more of a focus on the product itself, right, and the ability of that founder to execute. 
whether it, whether she's executing or she has someone on her team that's an executor. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Mm -hmm. That's neither here nor there. <laughs> but <laughs> someone who's going to actually execute on said product or said idea, that's the person that makes money. That's the startup that actually wins. Now, speaking about that other piece of it that you just articulated, people investing in who they know or what they feel comfortable with, um, for Black women, for women founders, what are some things that they need to look out for even in pitching to certain types of investors? So that, of course, like you said in the beginning, you're going to get a lot of no's, right? However, how do you navigate that uncomfortable space of this might not be the type of investor that would invest in me? What does, what does the founder need to do to, to own their own accountability in that? Sure. Research, you know, like I, first and foremost, know your investor, know what they've invested in already. Talk to the founders that are already in their portfolio. What is this investor's investment thesis? If you don't know these things, don't take a meeting with an investor. Don't do it because you're wasting your time and theirs. Um, you know, I you you I think that uh, I think that first of all, venture is so sexy, right? It's like ooh, venture capital. <laughs> I raised ten million dollars and it's mm. so great. Like, just know that there's a lot of drawbacks to taking venture money, right? Like, you know, the more you dilute your equity, um, the less of the company that you own. So understand what you want out of your financing. Do you want non-dilutive capital, i.e., you know, loans, grants, pitch competitions, equity crowdfunding, so on and so not equity, but just regular crowdfunding, uh, which allows you to keep your business for a longer period of time? Because if you take venture early, all you're doing is diluting yourself more and more and more until by the time you raise a Series A, Series B, you're working with 20%. <laughs> you don't even own the company anymore. Mm. So I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm actually a, a bigger fan of alternative uh, methods of financing. Um, and, you know, not to say that venture is terrible by no means, but, you know, I, it has to be balanced. You have to look at a, 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 almost like a, a, a fundraising stack, right? You've got multiple kinds of fundraising in, in your, within your funding portfolio. Um, and so, you know, with that in mind, You've got to research, research all your options, have good credit. <laughs> Number one, you know, good credit let, lets you go very, very far. Mm -hmm. SBA loans require a personal guarantee. So I don't care how awesome your business is, how much revenue you're generating, how many clients you've got in the pipeline, you still have to have a personal guarantee for an SBA 7A loan. So, you know, and yet that is non-dilutive money in the bank. So, you know, um, the investor conversation shouldn't necessarily, you shouldn't necessarily come into an investor conversation unprepared. Um, and therefore it shouldn't necessarily be awkward other than just the pushback and the no's and the, you know, not believing in your product, which again, plenty of investors are gonna do that, whether you, you know, you research them or not. For sure. And, and you just gave so many gems, Regina. I, and we talking about, you know, because you think about it, right? You said, look, hey, good credit. And you and I both know, and I'm sure a lot of people in our audience know, because of the systemic barriers that exist in our society, many Black and Brown people do not have good credit. I mean, and I'm not saying that, that in a generalization that every all Black people don't have it, but we know that this is a thing that Black and Brown people face on a consistent basis in order to get where they need to be. So even in that statement, I believe was a gem that, that we need to move the, the conversation forward. What are some other things specifically uh, specific to our communities um, that are challenges that we can own on our own and fix prior to coming to the table? I know, that, I know that was, I know that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So a couple things. Mm. Um, number one, have good credit, you know, for sure. Number two, we have to think big. Mm. Um, I find that oftentimes there's a lot of, you know, communities of color and not just, you know, black and brown folk, but just in general, you know, when you don't grow up with a sense of entitlement, then you play small, you play safe, right? And, and there are, um, you know, huge challenges with most times, you know, we play it safe because we get beat down so much, right? So there's a lot of, you know, being risk averse is something you cannot be in as a tech founder. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to accept and embrace 
uh, risk and uncertainty and, and be flexible with, with the wild, wild west. Um, and so therefore, when I say think big, I mean big. You know, we are, you know, we talk about creating billion dollar businesses, not million dollar businesses, right? not $10 million businesses, not hundred million dollar businesses. We're talking about billion dollar, multi-billion dollar businesses. Say it over and over again right. if you have to. So, you know, the top five trillion dollar businesses are Apple, Google, Microsoft, Tesla, and something else, right? All tech companies. So, you know, specifically at Black Women Talk Tech, we double click on technology because it allows us outsized returns, right? Mm -hmm. You're never gonna make a trillion dollar dry cleaning business. And love dry cleaning businesses, love daycares, love dog walking, fashion design, jewelry design, you like it, I love it. However, we are trying, we have, we have 450 years behind Hmm. Right. So we have to find technologies and find industries where we can leapfrog and at least try to get to <laughs> the starting point. Right. So in order to do that, got to think big. You got to think big and you got to start now. Just mm. start. So many times it's like, oh, man, somebody took my idea. Oh, you know, I was going to do that. OK, well, then th go do something else now. Now, <laughs> right? You know, now, <laughs> because what happens is you have to fail, right? Like I have failed miserably, <laughs> publicly, you know, and and you know you have to fail in order to learn, right? You've got to be able to get out there and iterate on your product, refine it, test it, get it, get the feedback, talk to customers, understand the problems, have somebody yell at you over the phone, like just all, you have to actually do those things. But you can't do it if you haven't started. You can't do it if you don't have a website up, if you don't have a product, if you don't have something to share with someone, a link, a, a document, an e like an email, something. So I, I, I definitely think those are those are two big things: is to think big and start now. Mm. That that that's a start, and that's a major start. <laughs> that's a major start. <laughs> now, Regina, how important or what role has out have allies played in your story? as a founder, because again, when we talk about levels of comfort and what's familiar to us, um, have allies played a role in your story? And if so, how did you navigate with those relationships to get what you wanted or needed or deserved? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, allies are critical. <laughs> you know, they, they are, you know, why I'm, I'm sitting here having a conversation with you, you know, um, you know, we, there's there's something to be said about, you know, understanding the environment within which we work and we operate and knowing what your role is. And, and I think that the allies that support us, they understand how the chips are stacked against us. And they're just trying to give us like a chip or two. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I appreciate that, but but they do it not just because it's the right thing to do, it makes everybody money. You yes. know, like this, this is not, this is not a feel good and a handout and a goodwill and a so on and so forth. Like they want to make money. We want to make money. We have some, we have the same goal. We have the same goal. So it's not to say that, you know, that there, there's, there's some, you know, beautiful, you know, say, save your, you know, type of situation here. It's, you know, I, I think that our partners at Microsoft have been, you know, very transparent in saying, Hey, you help us, we help you, mm -hmm. you know? And, and we're like, good, good. Sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We will take this check. Yes, we will. Um, and, and I think that there, I, there's multiple partners. We work with, um, you know, we work with JP Morgan Chase. We work with Google. We've worked with Goldman Sachs. We've, we've worked with Intuit. And, you know, we're bringing on, you know, so many more partners, Sephora, Estee Lauder, um, and, and, and I think that it's, it's just, it's a testament to, to the fact that there are companies that are very focused on, on supporting this community and they understand how valuable it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, you know, we can't, uh, discount that value, uh, whether it's monetarily or anything else or any otherwise. Now, Regina, I do want to get to this question that we talked about before we got on, um, before we run out of time, crypto opportunities 
what are your thoughts? Uh, what what space can women, Black women, people of color own in this space and, and taking advantage of these opportunities right now, today, like starting now? Sure. Yeah. So first, you know, if crypto is for you, again, if you think about being risk averse, you definitely cannot be risk averse <laughs> getting into cryptocurrency and um, you know, getting into Bitcoin and Ethereum, like you cannot be risk averse. You know, clearly we've also seen, you know, valuations skyrocket and then plummet. Um, because it is deregulated, there's pros and cons to that, right? So because it's deregulated, there's more access. You know, we talked about traditional banks. We talked about, you know, some of the barriers that exist for, you know, black and brown entrepreneurs to get loans and things like that. We're seeing, you know, crypto offerings where you can raise your money through, you know, through a, through a cryptocurrency. Um, and you can also lose your money <laughs> through through <laughs> cryptocurrency. So mm -hmm. you have to be willing to, to accept those risks, but also be able to enjoy like huge benefits and, and huge upside. Um, because of that deregulation. So the opportunity to access, the opportunity to get into the market um, is much more readily available within crypto than it is in, in, in other financial instruments. So that has to be a pro that, that we have to at least try um, to explore and, and try to capitalize on. So, um, you know, we're definitely seeing more and more um, black and brown people, not even entrepreneurs and, and not even, you know, specifically those in tech, everyone is, is getting into crypto, they're getting into the metaverse, you know, Web3, all of these kind of new frontier types of products, um, and not knowing whether or not it's going to, to be beneficial. You know, mm -hmm. we, we don't know whether, you know, sitting beside, you know, living beside Snoop Dogg in the met metaverse mm -hmm. is going to net us anything. Um, we have no idea, but guess what? It's good to just get in and see and see what happens if you can, mm -hmm. right? So the only other thing I will say with crypto is, you know, this is not the place where you like, we talked about the chips are stacked again. This is not a place to put all your chips, okay? So, you know, it, you want to be able to know that the money that you put in, you'll be okay if, it, if you never get it back, mm -hmm. right? Just like with any investment, just like with any other opportunity, if you're putting it in, just know It'll, it, you have to, whatever, however much you put in, let, if you don't get it back, you, it's no harm, no foul. So just, you know, kind of tread lightly there. So Regina, Black Women Talk Tech, Roadmap to Billions, getting all of these amazing founders funded, which is critical for success. Your hashtag is level up. So my final question for the evening is for those who really want to level up, whether it's an ally, an investor, or someone who needs to actually start that idea, what's that one piece of advice from Regina Gwynn, the co-founder of Black Women Talk Tech, that you would give to our viewers today? Um, I would say, you know, if, if you're thinking about starting a business, if you're thinking about, you know, exploring technology, uh, join us at www.blackwomentalktech.com. Yes. Um, come to our, uh, actually our next event that's coming up is our Face of a Founder Summit. So that's next Thursday, February 24th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And being able to, to, to log in, it will be digital, it'll be, it will be online. Um, I would definitely say start there, but as I also mentioned before, just get started. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's always my my biggest, you know, takeaway. The thing that's the most important is to start. Absolutely. I have so many questions, Regina, in the chat for you. So I do want to <laughs> wrap the session and then get to as many questions as we possibly can. Thank you so much, Regina Gwen, for all of your jewels today. As she mentioned, please be sure to follow Black Women Talk Tech on every vertical that exists out there. Um, go to blackwomentalktech.com and support Black Women Talk Tech, right? If you have some extra dollars and you want to add to someone else's founder story, be sure to invest there. So thank you, Regina. We'll go to the chat question. Questions. And I just, again, give you kudos for the work that you and your partner are doing. And we are here to support. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, for sure. So I have a couple of questions in the chat. We'll get to them. Um, someone said, I have an amazing idea. Um, where do I start? Um, okay. So if you have an idea, I think the first place to start is to validate that idea. So, you know, have you you know, tested the idea with, with, with potential customers. How many customers? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you have a product that those customers can, can go off and, and test and give you feedback? 
I would start there. Don't spend any more than $500, okay? Do not spend a lot in the idea phase. Please don't spend thousands of dollars setting up a website. Try to create, you know, drafts and try to try to create, you know, testing ideas that do not cost you money because you will end up spending money way too early. Um, and, and, you know, and then, and when you need it, because you've actually validated your idea, you won't have it. So, um, so, you know, start with a hundred bucks, start, start with $150 and, and, and just test the idea, see how well it fares, um, and, and use that learnings to iterate and refine the product, refine sure. the idea. And, and as Regina mentioned, testing could just be surveying and getting that feedback and that data from your target audience, right? Google form, Google forms are free. <laughs> Absolutely. Wix.com, free website, like free. Don't mm -hmm. even hundred fifty dollars. Fifty dollars, free, <laughs> free, <laughs> free. Find a product, build it for free. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great advice. Um, the next question was from Linda. Linda said, "Where can you find reputable developers of color?" That's a great question. Um, Dev Color is a, a great organization um, that focuses on, you know, developers of color, dev um, with a slash and then color, dev color is great. Um, I would also look at, um, hmm, you could might, you might wanna try, I mean, it's a broad question because there's all, there's developers everywhere, right? Um, and, you know, you may also wanna think about trying coding schools. So General Assembly, Greenhouse, you know, there's a ton of coding schools out here uh, and that will find you a junior dev, um, but, you know, but more senior developers, A, are super expensive and, um, and B, you know, usually working on, you know, other projects. So depending on what you're looking for, uh, I think there's a couple of different places you can look, but start, start with coding schools. There's always, you know, ways to, um, you know, find you know some some kinds of devs that are open and available and less expensive um, and then depending on what you're looking for i think also i guess one other thing i would mention is you know definitely just leverage your network post on facebook post on linkedin hey i'm looking for a dev and you know someone will refer you to someone and to refer you to someone else and then of course black women talk tech can't can't um can't can't forget that Correct. Come to our conference there's tons of devs Yes, and Kaylee actually um, dropped in uh, in the chat. HBCUs, I'm an HBCU sure. grad. Yes, for sure, for sure. Looking for black and brown talent. I, I think another part of the, the question here is for Regina, um, when you talk about the actual um, coding and finding the right people to actually build your team with, uh, how, how do you know when you expended too many resources? as a founder, when do you say, okay, this is my cutoff as a founder, as, as an investment in this? Is it the pain of I'm running out of capital on my side or, or what is that threshold? So the question is when to, when to wrap it up and like close up shop? Not, not when to close up shop, but when okay. to say, I'm gonna really actively do more to engage investor dollars or outside dollars versus using my own capital. Hmm. Hmm. So when, when the product, so, okay, so you imagine you've, you've got your product up and running and, you know, you're generating some revenue or you've, you've gotten to a point where, you know, the product is starting to get more buzz and more adoption and, and quote unquote, you know, the, whatever stage of traction you're in. If you look at your product roadmap and you say, okay, if, I, if you've gotten feedback from your customers that they want this feature, and this feature is not currently in the product and it's gonna cost you X amount of dollars to get a dev to implement that functionality into your app and you don't have that money, that's the time to go get some money. Mm. But, theoret but again, theoretically, you should know that before you've run out of money, okay? So, you know, this is where forecasting comes into play. This is where, you know, understanding what your product roadmap is. Maybe you had planned on implementing that functionality three months down the line, six months down the line, but you're finding that if you were to implement it earlier, you'd be able to get either more adoption, people would pay more for that service. There's, there needs to be some sort of formula that, that you, you've, you've created that can tell you that if you were to do this, that it would generate more revenue for you. Um, and if it does generate more revenue for you, then, then you, should, you should pursue you know, you know, making that investment and building out that product. For sure, for sure. 
Well, I think we covered the majority of the questions in the chat. Um, some notes are there from everyone. But again, Regina, this was like a masterclass. If, if people didn't take notes today, then, then they're, they're not interested in, in founding a technology. This was an amazing conversation. Um, I do believe that we may wrap with the Feely, um, Feely uh, head of house uh, for this. Uh, everyone saying brilliant wisdom, sending gratitude. Um, and so thank you everyone for staying today. And uh, thank you again, Regina, for this dynamic conversation. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much, ladies. Oh my God, it was powerful. Regina, you're amazing. I learned so much <laughs> personally. Really, I I I can like rewatch this recording like oh again and again and again. And Crystal, <laughs> one of our amazing mastermind members. Yeah, every time you speak, it's just like constantly inspired me. And tonight is uh, no exception. Exception. And uh, so happy to see everybody here. Thank you for trusting us and uh, in, enjoying this evening with us and also like spending time with us. And before we go, I also want to share with you ladies, we are a female founders mastermind. So that means we help women founders rise. So we're open to accept the new female founders to join our community. Our mastermind application is on a rolling basis. So feel free to check us out. Our website is feelytribe.com. And I will pass it to my co-founder and my better half, Jax. Thank you, ladies. Just want to say amazing conversation. So many gems dropped. The resiliency is so real in this room right now. So way to elevate our Wednesday in midweek. I thank you for your time, energy, and effort. Um, we just got a question in the chat. Where can people access this recording? This will be edited and placed on Feely's YouTube channel. Give us about a, a week to get it up. We'll notify everybody as soon as it's up. Um, if anybody needs it sooner or like urgently wants to replay it, just shoot us an email. I will drop my email here in the chat. And thank you and really appreciate everybody being here with us. So with that, I'll pass it to Maya. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. And thank you again, Crystal Regina, for your amazing work this evening. We are so honored and grateful to have you lead such an incredible workshop for our team and for our community. As our amazing co-founders Jacqueline and Summer stated, our cohort five applications are now open. The information is dropped in our chat and you can connect with us at Feely Tribe on Instagram as well. And lastly, we have an incredible workshop coming up on March 3rd with Ariana Barrett. It is open and accessible to our extended community and we would love to invite you all to join us. So I've dropped the event right link here for you and we hope to see you then. Thank you all so much again for being here with us this evening and I hope you have a great rest of your night. See you soon. Bye Thank everyone. You. Thank you.